it's humbling and a little bit terrifying to be sharing the stage with so many of my heroes. Um, it's a scary thing to be following John Hughes and um, and Jose and Philip and um, all these people that I, I respect so very much. Um, a little bit terrifying, I'm not going to lie. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about things that matter, not from Bruce Tate's perspective. The first thing that should matter to you listening to this talk is that in 2010, I got scared. And that's important to you because when, when I'm afraid, I write. And it turns out that the books that I write when I'm afraid, people like to read. And I don't know why that's true. <laughs> if I'm overconfident or excited about something, um, that's probably the, the first sign that it's going to crash. But when I'm, when I'm scared, um, good things can happen from a publishing perspective anyway. Um, and so when I got scared in 2010, I wrote this book called Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. Um, what an absolutely stupid title. Um, sure, everybody can learn a, a language a week, and you can do it for seven weeks running, and you can do something actually that's productive with that experience. But it turns out that other people were scared too, and my fear was resonating with, with many other people. We were seeing the same things, that the industry was changing, that the demands on programmers' time were changing, that the old tools and the old techniques weren't going to cut it anymore. And there were functional programming conferences back then. They weren't as, um, as busy, as, um, as interesting, as, um, as well-polished. Um, most of us were doing object-oriented languages at the time. And it turns out that enough people followed me um, through, this, through the journey with, with this book that um, I was blessed to have a sequel to the book that I wrote with, with a, couple of, um, a couple of good friends and, and um, even some other people that I look up to tremendously. And um, so what I would like to do is take not things that matter to me, but things to matter that matter to some of those people and roll them up into four principles that, um, that maybe you can take with you in your day-to-day -day, um, job or life or, or whatever. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the incubator, the idea that the problem that you're trying to solve when you build a language in the first place is very, very important. It's actually critically important. I've got a question that I don't want you to answer out loud. Um, how many of you technically have a lot of technical respect for Ruby? So there are a couple of hands going up there. Um, I've got to admit that um, there are some things that I really like about Ruby, but most of them don't have a lot to do with the technology. What I like about Ruby is the community and the feeling that, um, that Ruby fostered. Um, Matt's, um, Matt's, the creator of Ru Ruby, was actually the first language creator that I ever met face to face. And it was um, a near religious experience to me. And um, you know, it, it every time that I encounter um, that I encounter Matt at a, at a conference or um, or something like that, it's the experience is the same. He's he's such a humble, kind, and caring man. He doesn't strike me as the the kind of um, bold, aggressive person that you would associate with creating a language, but. His principles are so focused and so true that it's hard not to get excited with him. So Matt said, this is important now, the primary motivation was to amuse myself. <laughs> so wow, <laughs> um, he just wanted to, to play. He just 
wanted to um, to crack open his computer and and write a language that um, that he could just have a little bit more fun writing. So um, when you hear quotes from Matts, they always have words like um, fun and enjoyment and passion. All of those things are the things that I respect about Ruby. Um, when I wrote Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, it's, it's only an interesting book if it's a journey, right? It's, it's not interesting if there's seven disjoint little essays. But if they take you from an object-oriented place into prototyping languages, into things that are more, um, that, that are, uh, I guess, less step-by-step -step and, and more, um, more in the functional in the functional realm it's a more interesting journey but you have to come from somewhere and ruby was the place that i decided to come from so it was almost like i was pushing my little brother <laughs> and um and my confession here is that i really love my little brother i, I still use ruby um, day to day i like it a lot um, i'm very productive in it and um and this premise, this idea of, of um, Matz is really shown through to me. Um, so what's fascinating to me is that Matz had tremendous focus that really shines through in the language itself. So another language that is um, also interesting to me is a language called Lua. Has anybody ever coded any Lua? Oh, wow, a lot of you. So in seven languages in seven weeks, one, so the, the, reason, the, the way that I picked the seven languages was we asked the, we asked the audience, we asked the um, other people, other readers of um, the Pragmatic Bookshelf, with my publisher, um, of their books. And um, they picked nine languages, and I struck two of them, or I struck, struck three of them. And one of the ones that I struck was JavaScript. You know, I, I like JavaScript. I have a lot of respect for it. But can you imagine teaching all the principles in JavaScript in a single chapter? It's, it's nearly impossible because it's a little bit chaotic, not just with the programming model itself, but in how, how many places the programming model bleeds into something that's a little bit different. But there were two languages that I picked, one for the first book and one for the second book, that I picked ex explicitly to help bring the, the reader from object-oriented concepts to more functional concepts through prototyping languages. One of those prototyping languages was the I.O. language, and the second prototyping language was Lua. Now, Lua, I encountered actually building some configuration software for, um, for a home automation system. And it was interesting to me when I interviewed um, Roberto, and he said that that's precisely what the language was designed to do. It's kind of fascinating. How many of you have um, had some experience with Elm? So by applause, how many of you kind of like the experience so far? So I think that Elm is going to be a huge mover in the next couple of years. And the reason that I say so is that Evan, Evan Saplicki has a maniacal focus on exactly what he wants Elm to be, and he's not missing the mark at all. Take a look at the tagline. The best of functional programming in your browser, right? And when I interviewed Evan, I said, what are the things that you really want Elm to be, and what are the things that you don't want it to be? And he took those two questions that were actually in an email, and he answered both of them in this way. I'll let you guys, can you guys read that? So many functional folks have a way of saying extremely interesting and useful things in a totally inaccessible and practical way. Does that resonate with anybody? And I wanted to fix this. So with those two sentences, you know exactly where Evan is aiming with this programming language. Right? So he says that Elm is not about being theoretically better. It's about being demonstrably, demonstrably better. So Haskell was the language that 
evoke the most fear in me <laughs> with seven languages in seven weeks. I wasn't a functional programmer at all. I was an object-oriented programmer and a Ruby one at that. So I was used to simple, and I was used to um, not really having a lot of theoretical background. And um, so Haskell was a bit of a beast for me. Um, and it wasn't until many years later that I came to start to appreciate the complexity of Haskell. And it wasn't until this past summer, or actually about a year ago, when John Hughes and I had the pleasure of sharing an expert panel, and um, that I got to appreciate the history of Haskell and where it came from and um, some of the compromises that were made. So when I asked John what, um, what, what was kind of the catalyst for Haskell, he said, well, you know, there was a language for lazy programming at the time called Miranda. It was created by a guy named David Turner. And we approached David to ask him, um, could, could we establish uh, Miranda as, um, as, the, um, as the academic, lazy, de facto standard for uh, academic, um, lazy, functional programming languages? And John said, on the lazy side of FP, you had as many programming languages as you had researchers. And if he, David Turner, had said yes, Haskell would not exist. So they had a bogey that they wanted Haskell to be academic and free, let a thousand flowers bloom. They wanted it to be strict. They wanted it to be pure. They wanted it to be lazy. Now, this is interesting to me because this is a very successful and an aesthetically beautiful language, but it's also one that's created in a committee that, and that explicitly prefers academic to practical. It kind of seems a little incongruous to me. But I think that the thing that made Haskell successful was the focus on exactly what, what they wanted Haskell to be. In closure, are you getting a theme here, right? Successful languages have focus. Rich Hickey said, I wanted a lisp for functional programming, symbiotic with the existing platform, and designed explicitly for concurrency. Over and over and over, you see that the successful functional programming languages have a maniacal focus. They knew, they knew exactly what they wanted to be. So I thought I would take this test and I would apply it to another, to another language. So I did some research. I went way back, and I found Java's original marketing tagline. Has anybody ever seen it before? Can anybody recite it? OK. It's a trap. Don't, don't, don't go there. Your origins shape you. Right? So that's the first of the principles that I want to leave with you today. Your origins shape you. OK. The second of the principles is that you should know your community. And let me. Let me preface this with, with a statement that your community, the needs of your community, are going to change um, as um, the things that matter to your community are going to change as your community matures, right? Let me say that another way. So... Let's think back to the first commercially successful higher-level languages. You could argue that, they're, that these are um, two of the first ones. You could probably um, pick a different point in time if you wanted to. But the point is that there are three elements that are pretty important here, right? The first one is that the populations, uh, especially relative to now, are relatively small, right? And those populations were actually a captive audience because the information was pretty tightly controlled, was proprietary. And um, so you really had two profit centers for a programming language. There was, the, um, there was the language itself, and then there was the support all rolled up into one. Um, and often this was bound to the computing system that it was delivered on as well. 
So it was worth it to make a huge investment in a programming language. And this was the model that, um, that we carried forward for many years um, in the adoption of programming languages. The, the formula was, was pretty concrete, right? You, you, you get a company um, tied to some hardware platform, you invest a whole lot of money, and then you build a successful language. And this, um, it happened this way for 20 to 30 years um, from... You know, in, in the 50s, um, with, with, um, in the 50s and 60s with um, COBOL and Fortran um, and some of the earlier young languages to, um, you know, starting to roll into the 70s um, with C++ and, and um, into, the, into the 90s um, with, with Java um, and with, with Smalltalk and Erlang kind of following the same model. But we started to see the population increase, but... It was still, there were many different languages, but we cut those language, we cut those languages in, um, in a couple of, or we cut those populations in, in some very discrete chunks, so it was tough to get a critical mass. But when the internet happened, the world got smaller, and the support changed from being a profit center to a cost center because the companies recognized that once you captured the community, that, um, that big things could happen for your language. And you could have more than, than just a, um, an asset for a computing platform. The language itself could be a profit center for the whole company. And they could layer on um, services and products on top of that. So, um, so you still had large investments creating pro, um, kind of tailored around programming languages. Um, and driving programming languages, but for different reasons. Now, the large investment was starting to drive programming languages as profit centers for, um, for companies. And a couple of companies did this very well. But as the world got smaller, the game changed. Open source has changed everything. And if you think about it, just about every language on this list has an element of a very small group of people starting the language itself. Right? These aren't large companies anymore um, that, are, um, that, that are driving the programming languages. The populations, the populations that we're talking about are larger, but more importantly, it's easy to build a critical mass. So um, to give you an example, Java was developed primarily in a programming lab. Right? If you look at the languages that I'm interested in now, the Elixir programming language was developed by Jose, who's from Brazil, lives in Poland, um, was discovered by a guy named Dave Thomas. And um, we, were hard, we were having a, a tough time getting critical mass for the web server. Um, the web server at the time, uh, Jose um, initially built a web server called, um, was it Dynamo? I think it's Dynamo. And, um, and we got together. Um, I had a company that wanted to invest in, in Elixir. I really liked some of the founding principles of Elixir. And we recognized that it's too difficult for one person to establish everything that they need um, everything they need to establish to build both a language and a web server. It's kind of lunacy, right? So what we decided to do was to build a Lego kit for web servers. That's easy, right? So we built a Lego kit for web servers. So we're taking our bait, we put it on the fishing hook, we chunked it out there. And um, it wasn't two months later till Chris McCord found it and started building the Phoenix framework, right? So a guy from Brazil lives in Poland, wrote a language that was discovered by a guy in Dallas, Texas, right? Um, as when, after Dave Thomas wrote about it, I learned about it, went to London to meet with Jose uh, to kind of see him at a conference. We kind of connected, and, um, you know, we had this, um, this mutual fanboy moment where I was kind of nervous, and I said, J J Jose, it's nice to meet you. I'm a big fan. He said, well, yes. Idiot, your book is one of the things that inspired Elixir in the first place. 
And um, so we had this mutual fanboy moment. We, we talked about how to make um, Elixir succeed. And um, we put another line in the w- water, and we found this guy that was in Miami, Ohio. And um, that guy wound up building the... Um, so he wound up building the, uh, the web server that, um, that we know that is kind of helping Elixir explode today. So... Think about what that means, what that says about a community. So what that means is that it's, it's relatively easy for a small team to establish a relatively big community. But that's a double-edged sword, right? Because that community is, can now be more fickle because there are more programming languages to choose from. So approachability really, really matters, right? Think about Elm. The Elm language is built around accessibility. In fact, the first thing that you notice as you pick up Elm is probably something that looks like this, right? How many people found the Elm REPL in their first visit to the Elm website? It's crazy, right? And without doing any work at all, um, probably in the first two or three minutes of seeing the language, you're actually changing things and seeing how the screen response, right? You're running the whole cycle. You're um, pressing a button to compile things. You're seeing how things work. You're seeing how things break. You're seeing how things interact on the screen. You also are starting to build an intuition about how the signals flow and about, and say, hey, wait a minute, that's different. So, so a mouse position isn't really something that, that changes from time to time. A mouse position is really a signal um, a constant signal that, that maps x, y, and a time, that's just a function, right? Or think about the Ruby experience. How many of you have coded Ruby? How many people know this acronym? What does it mean? Matt says, nice, so Matt says nice, so we are nice. So a lot of people attribute Ruby on Rails to being able to, to, to the marketing strategy of taking the biggest guy in the room and poking him in the eye, right? To me, that's not where Ruby on Rails started. To me, Ruby on Rails started right here. Matt's is nice, so we are nice. And what this did is this attracted two people. One is a publisher named Dave Thomas who wrote the pickaxe book, that was really what most people that learned Ruby actually picked up to, to learn the language in the first place. The second person that um, it attracted was a guy named Jim Wyrick. And Jim Wyrick gave, don't get excited, that's Polish, not Polish. <laughs> so Jim Wyrick actually, um, he built the things that made Ruby approachable in the first place. He built the package management system. He built Rake, um, the build system. So it was very easy to, um, to ramp up and get started with, with um, Ruby on Rails. And then, once all of that foundation was laid, then the marketing firm called 37 Signals said, okay, um, what we need is, is now a marketing strategy that we could layer on the very top of this iceberg to actually break the surface. And that's, in fact, what happened. Okay, I have another weird story for you. <laughs> um, Erlang Solutions, sorry about this, <laughs> in advance. So I got to teach a workshop um, at Ericsson Systems. This is actually the home of, um, of Erlang, um, or I guess, I guess the birthplace of Erlang now. And um, the thing, my first impression of, of Ericsson in teaching the workshop was the door. So you only think that this is a joke. <laughs> um, the real door is actually much worse. <laughs> so, um, so as an instructor, I'm already terrified. I'm in, I'm in Sweden. I don't know my way around. I'm dyslexic anyway, so I can't, I can't read any of the street names. I don't know where I'm going. You know, I, I, I show up late to the class. And um, so 
this is all in, in um, kind, of, kind of a hurried speech as she's kind of shuffling me to the classroom. She says, okay, everybody has one of these badges. Uh, put this on. Okay, here's the door. You see the door? There's this big green sign that says open me. Don't press that. If you do, the alarm will sound, okay? So what you do is you take, you don't take your badge. If you, if you swipe your badge, the alarm will sound. You take this one that's propped up on the door. You swipe it through there, and then you walk through. Make sure that not too many people follow you through because if too many people follow you through, the alarm will sound, right? And then close the door, the door is closed, and then my class is in front of me, and I have to get started. Okay. <laughs> um, I can't get through the door, right? I can't get out of the door. But then I had a different experience. I got into, I got into the room, and I'm going to try to say this without getting myself in trouble. I don't know if I'll be able to do it or not. Um, in Texas, we have an issue with um, with dis- um, disparate lines at men's and women's restrooms. Um, whether you're at a sporting, sporting event or um, whether you're in the office. Um, in Erickson, they didn't have this problem at all. They had this problem solved. They had um, kind of an, an area where um, you know, there's a, a common uh, you know, hand-washing area and everything, and then there were these um, individual stalls that were mixed gender. I said, wow, this is concurrency for the restroom." I was so excited about this. I was going to be rich because I was going to take this idea back to Texas, and I was going to stop coding. And, you know, gosh, I, I would have solved all the problems in, in any um, Texas football game, which would make me famous, right? But to experience all that concurrency, you had to get through the door, Right? So Erlang is a beautiful language that hasn't been traditionally a very approachable language, right? But what we're seeing is the ideas in Erlang are getting a second chance because of a language called Elixir. Now, I'm not saying don't, please, please don't say that Bruce said that Elixir is Ruby for Erlang. It's not. Right? I'm saying that some of the approachability lessons from Ruby are being brought to Erlang, and it's making a huge difference. Mix is like rake. Um, the package management, hex, is like gems. The documentation, all of these things are, um, are starting to tell in the overall um, ability of the Elixir programming language to attract an audience because Elixir knows the community, knows how to make approachable technologies. Okay, so now we're going to get a little bit more aggressive. A good programming language has to make a stand. You've got to be willing to make somebody mad. Here are some of the things that I mean. So syntax. We're not going to spend an hour talking about syntax, but um, I do want to mention that there are a number of stands that you can take as they relate to syntax. Uh, for example, you might say that syntax has a profound impact on productivity. Right? In fact, Matt said that sugar makes, believed that sugar made programmers more productive. He says, languages are enhancers for your mind. They shape the way that you attack programming. Another stand that you can take is that syntax must be simple. In fact, two of the um, of my favorite languages in terms of exploring theory embrace this concept. Smalltalk has one of the most beautiful, simple, simplest syntaxes um, of of its time, as does the closure programming language. You could carry this, you could carry this to another extreme and say, syntax has a profound impact on program design, right? Like Lisp. You could say that syntax has to be profoundly simple and uniform, right? In Lisp, data is code. They're the same thing. In I.O., this is a prototype language, a lot like um, the Lua programming language, um, that has 
gosh, you could read the syntax, um, the, um, the syntax form in you know, probably four or five lines, right? Or you could say, you can build macros the same way that they're built in Lisp, and you don't have to marry yourself to, to data as code. You can marry, you could say, the syntax tree is data. Right? Do you see the difference? And that's the approach taken by Elixir. So Elixir gives you, um, says that we want um, rich syntax, but we want um, the programmable syntax tree. You could take another stand. You could say that syntax has a profound impact on market share. Um, in fact, you, know, you almost feel sorry for small talk because small talk is a language that lost twice. You think about it, when, when C was around, um, small talk was kind of sitting back in the background. It was slowly gaining, um, gaining momentum in the academics, in the ap academic field. And IBM was starting to experience some success with, um, with, a, um, with a product that eventually became Visual Age. And um, it kind of stalled, right? And the thing that stalled it was that Gosh, we started with this thing called C. We said, well, wait a minute. If you want to do object-oriented code, why don't you stay within the C community and, um, and write in C++? Now, was C++ really object-oriented code? Of course not. Most people wrote C code in C++, right? They wrote procedural code in C++. So it was really like a C++ minus minus, right? But what really happened is they were able to start to move, um, move the program community to a new their program com community to a new paradigm, and the same thing happened a second time with the same syntax family, right? When it was clear that C++ was not object oriented and was really never going to be palatable by the typical programmer, um, you know, you can you can imagine the award ceremony and and. You know, small talk sitting back here, ready to step, to step forward. And, and the winner is Java, right? And Java basically made the argument that, we, that if you want to write object-oriented code, you could stay within the same syntax family, right? And um, even though it wasn't, wasn't really... Um, it wasn't really the, the best of arguments from, from a, a theory standpoint. Um, it was still, it had a profound effect on the market share. Right. You can see stands, you can see aggressive stands taken by almost all programming languages. Um, any language, um, any successful language today um, takes at least one aggressive stand. Haskell takes a, a bunch of them, will be lazy, will be pure will be strict and static, right? Erlang, there was a great conversation that I heard between Joe Armstrong, um, creator of Erlang, and, um, and David Turner, <laughs> the creator of Miranda. And um, you know, David was, um, it was, was a big advocate of, of static typing um, and, and strict lazy programming languages. And so David sincerely looks at, at Joe and he says, you know, I never expected a language that was so dynamic to be as, um, to be as reliable as Erlang has become, right? And um, the reason is that Erlang was built to be reliable from the ground up. Um, First, things are, concurrent, are built concurrently from, from the ground up. And second, um, things are built with the supervision structure. How many of you saw Jose's talk um, yesterday? So the supervision structure basically means that when something breaks, we can restore it to the last known good state, right? Um, you know, that's the, the shirt, when in doubt, or keep calm and let it crash. I had to read my own shirt. That's great. Um, 
But basically, basically, if you're going to succeed, you have to take a stand. With, with Elm, there are a couple of stands. The first one is that you have to be approachable. We've talked about that one. The second one is that callbacks stink, right? So what are the principles that we've talked about so far? What was the first one? Yes, where you come from, the incubator. What's the second one? Know your community. And the third one, make a stand, right? So the last one is adapt or die, right? I'd like, to think, I'd like us to think for a moment about the great inventions and the reason that we think that the great inventions are great. The wheel is a multiplier of leverage. The gear. The printing press. It's really a multiplier of mental leverage. Right? Electricity. The transistor. And I'd like to think about programming in the same way. Efficient programming design is about the multiplication of leverage. So it's about taking ideas and representing them in idioms. And if you think about it, the language that can roll up the idioms into larger idioms so that you need fewer idioms to represent an idea is going to be the winner, right? And that's the language with the right set of abstractions. So when you talk about extensions, and here I'm really talking about taking a language and extending it beyond its, um, its, intended, its in intended space, you're talking about things like, in Erlang, the parse transform. In Java, it's um, aspect-oriented programming um, and ins inspection. In Ruby, it's the open class that looks something like this. Right, so here I have a string and, and um, nil class and an object, and I have, I declare the method blank question mark. Right, and this lets me represent, this lets me call any object and say, are you blank? Right? So efficient program design takes the same principles. You can take the same principles and apply them to efficient language design. So as I approach the languages in, the, in both seven languages and seven weeks books, I recognize something. The languages that, could, that were bootstrapped were the more effective, were the languages that moved the most quickly. So that adaptation um, really became, so when a language could adapt itself rapidly, um, you could actually, um, only then could you get to the place where you could extend the language with um, things like DSLs that, um, that uh, make a language so much more productive. And now we're kind of getting to the, um, uh, the mature content of this presentation. Okay, don't hit me. I'm going to say the word macros. Um, let me talk a little bit about, about what I mean. So if you haven't seen a macro before, basically, this is a list program. It means um, take, take this function and add one to two, right? The thing that's interesting about that is that this is data, and this is also code, right? This is a program that's going to be executed and this is a program that's not going to be executed. This quote transfers, transforms the function to a string. Right? And then I can reason about this program in the same way that I could reason about any other data. And then I can extend the language in the language itself. Right? So let me give you an example of a place that this could make a difference. In the Erlang language, this is a code. This is some code that's going to um, that's going to um, take a reference um, 
spawn a process, and then await a result, right? So it's basically, um, it's going to allow me to um, do some intermediate work um, while I spin, spin a second process. This is what the same program looks like in the Elixir language. I create a task, do something else, and await the task. Right? Now, doubtlessly, I, I could create something that looks a little bit closer to this in Erlang with the parse transforms and other tools. But in the Elixir language, since I'm coding at basically a lower level of, or at of a higher level of abstraction, I have the, the language creators themselves are working in bigger idioms. Um, and then the programmers can work in larger idioms so that, um, so that I'm working with tasks instead of seeing this repeated pattern. Right? Another example. This is a pipe operator. Um, it's like composition in Haskell. And um, I want to talk about combining this operator with a couple of tools. The first one is def macro, and that's basically the technique that we just talked about. We're not going to write a macro, but I want to show you kind of um, what, uh, what the end results would be. But def macro allows me to treat code as data, right? And I want to talk about def protocol. Def protocol takes an abstract type and allows me to bind um, common behaviors to that abstract type. OK. So let's say I have some widgets, and I want to filter them and map them, and then, um, and then say, take the first five. Right? It should be um, a pretty common functional type program. And you can see that the pipe works a lot like a Unix pipe, where I take the output of the thing on the left and apply it to the thing on the right. And the nice thing about this is that I can represent things as, a, as an assembly line. But with protocols, this becomes a little bit more um, powerful and valuable. right? So a stream is exactly what you think it is. It, is a, um, it can be something um, that doesn't have a, a defined endpoint. right? So streams are lazy, um, enumerables are eager, right? And I could take the same program and I can run through, um, run um, streams through them instead of um, running, running enumerables through them. So I can also, now we're going to apply the concept of macros, right? Let's say that these couple of tasks are really expensive, so maybe I want to run um, these, uh, these parts of the programs in different processes. Well, I just call a macro, and the macro can inspect the syntax tree and, um, and take this apart, basically fire a process, and um, pass the results on to another process. Right? Or, Maybe I want to use a process farm instead. Right? Or maybe I want it to be a distributed farm. Or maybe I recognize that this model has too much marshalling, and a better model would be to have um, the distributed farm on the outside. Right? So the idea is that I can take this, these two common, um, common ideas, def macro and def protocol. These are idioms, and I can layer them on top of each other and get a multiplied effect. OK, so other examples of extension like this. We have type classes in Haskell that are tremendous multipliers of leverage. Or the idea that Elm supports, wraps I.O. in something called signals. So you have this idea that rather than um, exposing monads to um, my end user, I wrap them up as language features. Or the, in Julia, the idea that I can take macros and I can represent flat data structures as distributed data structures. So I could have, um, I could have scientific programming languages 
um, that uh, that can distribute that can manage concurrency much better than um, than the existing alternatives. Or you have the Idris programming language that can that can start to introduce um, programs into the type specifications so that if I have a if I want to add two lists together, well, rather than just saying a list of a list plus the list gives you another list, I can say a list of size M and a list of size N added together give you a list of M plus N. Right. So adaptation is very important. So what are the four principles that we talked about? What's the first one? The incubator, right? Your origins shape you. The second one. Your community, yeah. Know your customer. The third one. Make a stand. The fourth one. Adapt or die. Right. Any questions? Thank you.